uh, hi again. Uh, we just had confirmation that uh, we have someone to play the videos. So uh, again, welcome to panel five, uh, utilizing biodiversity in indigenous lands. We have three presentations this afternoon uh, coming from studies that are uh, that were done in very interesting areas. Uh, one in the Cordillera, one in Palawan, and another one in uh, Batanes. So if we may proceed. Okay. Uh, okay. If we proceed, uh, our first uh, paper is entitled Floral Diversity Assessment Within the Tri-Boundaries of Benguet, Ifugao, and Mount Province. It will be presented by uh, Professor Pastor Malabrigo Jr. To introduce our uh, author, Professor Pastor Malabrigo Jr. is currently an as associate professor and uh, now serves as a chair of the Department of Forest Biological Sciences College of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. His fields of specialization include plant taxonomy, marine botany, biodiversity conservation, and forest restoration. And today he has already authored five books and uh, 20 scientific publications in various respected journals. He has presented 15 oral uh, and poster papers in both local and international conferences. Uh, he is the lead author of the book uh, entitled Shades of Magic, 88 Philippine Native Trees that won the 2013 Best Book in Science and in 2014, the Gintong Aklat Award in the science category. Uh, this paper that he, uh, he will be presenting was co-written with uh, Gerald Eduarte and Professor Diomides Raselis of the College of Forestry and uh, Natural Resources, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. So, uh, okay, just some reminders. Uh, if you have questions uh, to the different authors, please uh, reserve them until the end of, uh, towards the end of the session where we will be uh, entertaining uh, all of your questions, please write them in the chat box uh, and we will read them. Or you may raise your hand during the, the question and answer portion uh, so we can uh, allow you to speak. Okay, if, if uh, Mitzi is uh, ready, we can now present uh, the present uh, the video of uh, Professor Pat Malabrigo. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my co-authors, Forrester Gerald Eduarte and Dr. Diomedes Raselis, I am pleased to share with you the results of our study on the floral diversity assessment within the tribe boundaries of Benguet, Ifugao, and Mountain Province. In the interest of time, I'll go straight to my introduction. So the tribe boundaries of Benguet, Ifugao, and Mountain Province is host to one of the few remaining heavily forested areas in the country particularly in the Cordillera administrative region. It also serves as the major headwater of Abra and Chico river basins that constitute almost two thirds of the entire Cordillera region. However, the area is currently under threat from destructive human activities such as illegal poaching, kainin, and vegetable farming, which are in turn the results of worsening poverty in the surrounding upland communities. One of the strategies to ensure the effective management of the forest and natural resources in the area is to harness their potential to provide sustainable sources of livelihood to the local people, to win them out from the destructive activities. In order to realize this, one must first assess the extent of resources present in the area, particularly their carbon storage potential and level of biodiversity in view of the current initiatives of the government to promote climate change mitigation and biodiversity conservation. This study I am presenting is actually part of a bigger project, which also include carbon stock assessment of the area. But for this presentation, I will only discuss the floral diversity assessment, where I, where I serve as the study leader. So the objectives of the study are as follows. 
to capacitate local stakeholders in the conduct of biodiversity assessment, to assess the floral diversity within the tribe boundaries of the province of Benguet, Ifugao, and Mountain Province, to provide lists of flora species present in the study site and determine their conservation status, and lastly, to provide some recommendations uh, on strategies on the biodiversity conservation of the area. So our study area is basically, basically, uh, basically covered the municipalities of Bauco in the mountain province, Bugias in Benguet, and Tinok in Ifugao. And just like any well-planned biodiversity survey, we first conducted desktop scoping and review of available information about the area. This is for initial habitat characterization and sampling stratification. Uh, and uh, this is also to make sure that all the major vegetation types are represented in our sampling method in order to encounter as many species as possible. As you can see in this figure, we can have uh, we have sampling plots from closed forest, open forest, both broadleaf and coniferous, as well as uh, as well as in other uh, woodland areas. For sampling method, we originally we originally plan to follow the BAMS method for standardization and for better comparison with other studies. However, the two kilometer modified belt transect recommended by BAMS is not applicable in the area since the remaining forests are mostly small patches, usually less than 500 meters in extent. So instead, the team used the sample plots established for forest carbon measurement for identification and measurement of trees. This revised methodology extended the coverage of biodiversity assessment since all the plots for carbon were included in the plot survey. In addition, this synchronized uh, the carbon measurement with pre inventory in the first place all trees for the biomass plots must be properly identified. So this is the adopted uh, plot for carbon stock assessment and for the biodiversity assessment as well. It's a 20 by 100 meter plot with a further nestling of five by 20 meters and one by one meter for understory and ground cover respectively. We were able to sample 40 plots for a total of eight hectares. And in addition to that, opportunistic sampling involving identification and photo documentation of species were conducted inside and outside the plots. For data analysis, we computed for the importance value of each species to determine the most dominant species in, in the area in terms of density, frequency, and basal area. The sum total of the uh, relative values of these parameters is the species importance value index. For the computation of uh, diversity indices, we use the uh, paleontological statistical software package for education and data analysis or PAST version 3.2. Data on the occurrence of uh, each species and their richness in survey plots were primarily used in the computation of the Shannon, Simpsons, and Evenness index. Okay, for the results, the study area is a mosaic of uh, different land uses, consists of closed forest, open forest, grassland, and agricultural lands. The remaining forest cover is approximately 795 hectares, which is almost 66% of the total area. But the remaining forests are highly frag fragmented and occur in relatively small patches. Again, this, it's an indication of intense anthropogenic disturbance. Most of the remaining forests fall, fall under uh, either tropical lower mountain rainforest with the presence of broadleaf forest and pine forest types or tropical upper mountain forest or what we call the mossy forest. So the polygon with the dotted line boundary is our study area, which was pre-drawn pre and pre-selected by the uh, DNR car prior to our engagement. A very large proportion of the study, about 90%, covers Bauco municipality of Mountain Province, with very small portion in Bukias Benguet and in Tinok Ifugao. The remaining forest in the area is composed mostly of open pine forests, while the remaining closed forest is only around 12 hectares. A total of uh, 32 morpho species belonging to 26 genera and 24 families were found 
inside the 40 something plants. But additional 94 species were, doc were documented from opportunistic sampling. These are mostly non trees, orchids and herbaceous, uh, and other uh, shrubs. These are mostly, uh, uh, or, or the dominant families for trees were Pinaceae, Fagaceae, Myrtaceae, Pentaphylacaceae, Podacarpaceae, and Ericaceae. So the average number of trees per quadrat, uh, the quadrat is again 20 meters by 100 meters, is approximately 33 trees. Or when you, if, you, if we convert it to hectare, then it's 165 trees per hectare. This is quite lower or understaffed as compared to other tropical lower mountain forests that we surveyed, which has more than 200 individual trees per hectare. And significantly lower as compared to vegetation on lower elevations, such as the tropical lowland evergreen rainforest, which could have a density of 300 trees per hectare. But this is understandable because uh, many sampling plots fell on the pine forest characterized by almost even its stand without other regenerations. The average diameter for all trees inside the plot is 30.05 centimeters, which could be classified as medium-sized trees. Among the most abundant species are the Benguet pine, Palayan, a species of Philippine oak or Lithocarpus, Boltec, it's a local name, a uh, species of Sisidium, Papat egg, Yuria coriacea and again, Lacricarpus imbricatus. It is important to mention that uh, the local people collect collectively call a number of Sisidium species as Bulte. We were able to recognize at least five species of Sisidium they call by the same name. They, they call by the same name, Bulte. Surprisingly, for the two Yuria species, Yuria coriacea and Yuria buxifolia, they have different local names. But uh, actually, there is another urea SP, which we haven't identified yet, that they also call Papat X, same with urea coriacea. I'm not sure if they base their naming from the wood characters, hence these collective terms. Trees with the largest average diameter uh, was Jimilina. So yes, even at more than 2,000 meters above sea level, there were already large Jimilina planted in the area, despite its proximity to the natural forest. Other large trees include uh, Gatilei, Cryptocaria tomentosa, Igem, and Benguet pine, as well as Schiflera glabra, a three species of Schiflera. Of the 126 Morpho species recorded, only 81 species were identified to species level. The others were only classified to genus level due to absence of identifying characters the flowers and the fruits. Uh, it, but it also reflects that plants in the area are not just uh, the common ones or the widely distributed species that can easily be identified. So 36 out of the 81 species, or roughly about 45%, were found to be endemic to the Philippines. That's quite a high uh, endemism rate. So this includes the rare species of orchids, including Ceratostylis ramosa, Dendrochylum cinnabarium, Dendrochylum uniforme, Liparis philippinensis, Pinalia philippinensis, among others. In fact, there were more than 20 orchid species encountered, and two of which could be new to science or undescribed. Unfortunately, we don't have the complete specimen collection needed for its publication. Six species recorded were found to be threatened under Philippine Red List, published as DNR Administrative Order 2017-11, and or under the IUCN Red List of threatened species. Uh, the, new, the newest version is 2021-1. Here are some photos of the uh, threatened species found in the study area. Most noteworthy among the list is Lepidaria quadriflora a species of mistletoe from the family Lorantasi. This species is a province endemic. Its natural distribution is confined to the high elevation forest of Benguet and nowhere else in the planet. Berberis barandana is an endemic species, but in the Philippines, it is only known to occur in Benguet and mountain province. 
Egem and Mountain U are non endemic species, but also confined to high elevation mountains of Luzon and Mindanao. Based on the computed importance value, the five most important or most dominant species are Benguet pine, Alayan, Multek, Egem, and Bini. These five species are all known to be high elevation mountain dwellers. They account to almost 40% of the total importance value of all species surveyed in the area. For the diversity index, the computed channel index of the different plots varied from as low as 0.69 to as high as 1.97. Quadrat one had, had the highest Shannon and Simpson's index attributed to the highest number of species with uh, 18 species recorded on that quad, on that plot and quadrant. So most of the plots have low to very low diversity based on the Shannon diversity classification uh, by uh, Dr. Fernando. So the lower diversity ex is expected as it is the general elevational trend in the tropics. So as we go along, as, as we move uh, to higher elevation, diversity decreases. So in addition, most of the plots surveyed were dominated by Benguet, Benguet pine. For the conclusion, results of the study revealed that the tri boundaries of Benguet, Mountain Province, and the Fugao is home to at least 126 species of plants. The diversity may be low as compared to other forests in lower elevation, but it contains some of the rarest ecological important high elevation species, including some province endemic. Unfortunately, the biodiversity in the area is being continuously threatened primarily by caingin and conversion to agriculture. The forests are mostly in small patches as the surrounding areas were already converted to vegetable farm. If there will be no positive intervention in the area, it is expected that there will be more forest reduction in the future. On the positive side, we observe that the local people has a good pre-identification skill, though they may be underestimated the diversity of the area due to merging of some species and calling it collectively by a name. At least those species taken collectively are closely related taxon taxonomically. As I have mentioned earlier, Boltec is the collective name for a number of species, but all belong to the genus Sisidio. We are hopeful that the results of the study that we provided to the DNR will not stay in the office drawers or frameworks. Uh, these are important references that could provide the quantitative basis for effective management of the area, especially in conservation prioritization. In the first place, this is the main objective of, of the study as written in our terms of reference. For our recommendations, we suggest that similar study be conducted to other parts of the tri boundaries, as well as the nearby forest. We must understand the scarcity of information with regards to our native biodiversity. And just like our old saying in conservation science, we cannot conserve what we do not know. Hence the need for more biodiversity study. We also suggest that the BAMS, Biodiversity Assessment and Monitoring Systems, be expanded outside of the protected areas. Pursuant to NIPAS Act, uh, every protected area is mandated to conduct biodiversity assessment and monitoring. But we have more forest ecosystems that are not proclaimed protected area. The biodiversity in those areas deserve to be known and discovered. Each of our forest ecosystems are so unique that species composition could greatly differ even in the same province or adjacent muni municipalities. There must also be a regular capacity building program for the local staff and stakeholder to further improve their parataxonomist, parataxonomist identification skill. We recommended that the results of the study be utilized by DNR as well as other stakeholders to conserve the biodiversity in the area. At the very least, the noteworthy species identified in the study should be considered the flagship species for conservation in the province. Lastly, it is extremely important to strengthen the forest protection system in the area. 
local people should be made aware of the importance of the unique plant species and be engaged in the conservation and processes. We are, all, we are all biologists in our team. We are not anthropologists nor community development persons. But we believe that the participation of all stakeholders in the tribe boundaries is the key to conserve, protect, and bring back this rare species to abundance. To end my presentation, I would like to take, to take this opportunity to extend our uh, thanks and gratitude to the following organizations who made the study possible. To DNRCAR for trusting us uh, on this project, to Global Envir Environment uh, Facility and Asian Development Bank for the funding support, and uh, of course to our colleagues, uh, UPLB College of Forestry and Natural Resources for allowing us to use official time for the conduct of the study. Thank you all for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Malabrigo for your presentation. So we uh, will have the questions uh, later after the two other uh, presentations. So if we may proceed with our uh, next paper, uh, the title is Structure and Function on Bird Traps Among the Palawan on Palawan Island, the Philippines. Uh, this will be presented by Dr. Takashi Tsuji, who is a Japanese ecological anthropologist and a senior regional geographer. His current concern uh, or area of interest at the moment is uh, water buffalo milk use in Southeast Asia. His main papers uh, are the technique and ecology surrounding moray fishing, a, a case study of moray trap fishing on Mactan Island, Philippines, uh, which was published in Prehistoric Marine Resource Use in the Indo-Pacific region uh, in 2019. Uh, his other paper, uh, which is related to, to this presentation, is entitled An Ecomaterial Cultural Study on Bird Traps Among the Palawan of the Philippines. Uh, this was published in uh, Nadi Tira Widya, which is, I, I think, Indonesian, in uh, 2019. Uh, and uh, another paper uh, entitled An Ethnography of the Wedge Sea Hare in Mactan Island, which was also published in the same uh, journal in 2019. Uh, so I would like to give the floor now to uh, Dr. Tsuji. I am Takashi Tsuji, a researcher of Graduate School of Agriculture, Saga University, Japan. In this presentation, I will make a presentation entitled Structure and Function on Bird Traps among the Palawan on Palawan Island, the Philippines. This presentation is composed of introduction, purpose of this presentation, methodology, results, and summary and conclusion. Now I move to the main subject. I have mainly studied about subsistence activities of the indigenous people in Palawan Island for 23 years. This presentation is about their hunting activity of birds. In the Philippines, bird hunting is practiced everywhere according to several ethnographies and my long-term observations. People enjoy hunting birds for several purposes. Actually, bird hunting is illegal, but the hunting methods in transition should be re recorded to preserve the indigenous culture and technique. It's a work of anthropologists. Biological resources, including birds, are rich and some of them are endemic species in Palawan Island. Unfortunately, several animals and plants there are in critical condition, 
due to overexploitation and smuggling activity. Especially, Palawan Island is a hot spot in the country. This presentation is to think of bird conservation through researching about bird traps. Animal hunting must be one of human nature's necessary and unnecessary. In Palawan Island, many birds are hunted for the meat, pet, and pet trade, etc. Purpose of this presentation is to focus it on the structure and function of bird traps found in the Palawan in southern Palawan. Specifically, the structure of bird traps, the production, materials, and the mechanisms are examined. Furthermore, the functioning of the Palawan community, the targeted birds, and reason to hunt birds was also examined. Finally, this presentation investigate the relationships between birds and human through the bird traps. There are a few systematic previous studies about bird traps in the world. One of the significant studies was conducted by Hans Barb as bird trapping and bird banding. This work researched almost 200 kinds of bird traps in the world, but the data are linked to cases of Western countries unavailable to know the case of the Philippines. In the Philippines, there is a classic study about bird traps published in 1930 by McGregor and Gardner. They are ornithologists and described 13 kinds of bird traps in the Philippines. They reported that some bird traps capture birds in a lab, not killing them. No other remarkable studies of bird traps can be found in the Philippines. As for methodology, this research was conducted in a Palawan village of southern Palawan Island. Main research was conducted from August 9 to 20, 2013. Research methods were participatory observation, interview, and questionnaire survey. Tagalog was used for the research language. Research area is near from Borneo and the fauna are similar to Borneo. Some birds are endemic species in Palawan Island. The Palawan is basically a sifting cultivator, secondary engaging in fishing, hunting, and gathering, copula production, and livestock husbandry. Results show the Palawan engage in bird traps. Five types of snare traps called litag and four types of wire traps called silo. They also hunt birds without traps using bird lime, bird whistle and imitation of bird cries. Blowgun and slingshot are also used. This 
station focuses on bird traps, snare and wire traps only. If you are interested in other methods, please read my paper listed in the end of this PowerPoint. The paper is free downloadable from ResearchGate. At first, I will show you some types of snare traps. Most snare traps are worked by a spring and killing and wounding birds. This is a powerful snare trap called Bintuka and can catch even monkey and wild boar. Basically, even children can make snare traps, but this trap needs a, a skill and the old knows and knowledge to make it. Next, this is a snare trap called Pidlom using alocasia or bigger fruit to lure birds. Next, this snare trap is called Crank Up using a drop lid. This trap is specialized mainly to catch quails and being alive without killing and wounding birds. Here, I would like to show you two types of wire traps. At first, this wire trap called Labai is mainly used to trap red jungle fowl or wild chicken called Labuyu. This trap is used by men and catching this wild chicken is one of hobbies for men. Catching wild chicken is a fame among the Palawan men. This trap was used to make with rattan, but population of rattan were decreased due to over-exploitation. Today, nylon is mainly used instead of Latin. Next, this trap called Rakar is also a wire trap set in a bird nest and catch birds that make nests on trees. Snare traps and wire traps are frequently used among the Palawan people. But some snare traps such as Sarok and Bintuka are not much made because the techniques are difficult compared to other snare traps. As for materials of traps, bamboos are most used and basically bird traps are made of plant materials. However, nylon is generally used since rattan resources were decreased. Nylon was probably introduced around 1950 when immigrants rushed to the island. Nylon can make traps, rainfalls, and must enhance productivity of the traps. At least 30 kinds of birds are hunted. Parrot, quails, and red jungle fowl and doves are remarkably listed. No seasonality for bird trapping except for migrated birds. Quail is the most trapped bird for the Palawan. Probably it's easy to trap and the resources are abundant. Men and women 
also highly trapped quails. Bed jungle fold become the trophy for men. Why do people hunt birds? There are several reasons. People recognize birds are foods. Good bush meat. Then people use birds for pets and also like a breed them. Some women like to enjoy bird songs and some men like to hunt birds such as red jungle fall for hobbies. That is a sport hunting. Although people mostly enjoy trapping birds, some people hunt harmful birds for their fields to prevent from damaging crops. That is, people hunt birds with feeling of both joy and sorrow. The relationships between people and birds are diversified. Now I summarize and conclude this presentation. As for summary, this research found that nine types of bird traps, five snare traps and four wire traps are used among the Palawan in research site. Plants, especially bamboos, are basic materials of bird traps, but nylon is also frequently used instead of rattans that was originally used and decreasing in the area. Thirty kinds of birds are targeted and main target is a quail. People hunt birds both by killing and by being alive according to their purposes. The purpose of bird hunting is mainly for obtaining the bush meat and for breeding as pets to enjoy the songs, sport hunting. On the other hand, People hunt harmful birds for their fields that are important subsistence of the shifting cultivation. In terms of the structure, bird traps of the Palawan were made of plants basically, but nylon is also used. It may relate to enhance the productivity and to make the traps robust. People tend to choose wire traps to hunt quails and women mostly engage the trapping. Some snare traps need skillful techniques for production and rarely made especially by younger generation. Traps don't need to chase birds and people can just wait until the targets are trapped. Traps are the time-saving hunting gears under the main subsistence activity. Next, as for the function Bird traps are necessarily to satisfy people in terms of pleasure and obtaining some animal proteins in their given environment with no amusements. People enjoy bird trapping but can't always catch birds. People may not think of efficiency and seek for enjoyment in their living world. People play with the birds by using the traps. 
the simple traps may contain the element of deep play. Trapping birds is a rationality act, but they are based on human irrationality as homo ludens. Finally, it's evaluated that bird traps are indigenous precious material culture. Although bird trapping is illegal activity, it must be sure that bird trapping decreases bird population, but the technique may not be elaborative to hunt over the birds. Bird traps of the Palawan may contribute to conserve birds naturally in some degree. Bird traps can tell human-animal relationships in natural world that is being less in contemporary world. This presentation concludes that bird traps are evaluated as tools to connect between birds and human in cultural and ecological viewpoints. If you are interested in this work, please check my paper in ResearchGate and deepen your concerns about the relationship between human and birds. I will also appreciate if you had strong concerns about the indigenous culture in Palawan Island. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Suji, for your presentation. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we will now have our last but not the least uh, presentation for today. Uh, we are quite fortunate to have in our panel today uh, the Chancellor of the University of the Philippines, Baguio, to give her paper. Uh, professor Corazon Abanti is a professor of economics at the Institute of Management here at UP Baguio. Uh, she holds a PhD in economics and her research interests include the application of economic valuation in natural resources, environmental goods, tourism and heritage, payment for environmental services and water economics and governance. Uh, she will be presenting her paper uh, entitled Perspectives on Values of Biodiversity in a Natural Protected Landscape and Seascape, the case of Batanes. So I, I give you uh, Professor Abanti. Okay, so thank you, uh, Professor uh, Dison. So may I request uh, for my video to be uploaded? So I have this video, it also has its audio. So we just play it. My presentation this afternoon is on perspectives on values of biodiversity in national protected landscape and seascape, the case of Batanes. How do communities value biodiversity in protected areas like the Batanes Islands? A community's intention and decision to protect and preserve the ecosystem and its biodiversity is contingent on how they value these resources. For biodiversity and other biological resources, the absence of apparent value combined with poorly defined property rights creates a problem of over-exploitation and unregulated use. Because much of the value is implicit rather than explicit, biodiversity continues to be lost at an unprecedented rate. The most crucial step towards building a sustainable community that respects biodiversity is to correct one of the biggest misconceptions about the environment, that natural resources are infinite. The importance of ecosystem services to human beings can be translated into economic valuation using a variety of methods. Understanding community values can improve communication and ownership of decisions about the management of natural resources and their efficient use. The study area is Batanes, one of the eight national parks covered in my study. Major protected areas in northern Luzon were identified and characterized in terms of their size, biodiversity characteristics, and anthropogenic activities. 
I'm sharing with you now the highlights of Batanes Islands. My photos of Batanes undeniably can do justice to its natural magnificence, but let me describe the scenic islands and beautiful seascapes in the northernmost province of the Philippines. Batanes has a total area of 213,578 hectares of which 20,323 hectares are land and 193,255 hectares are marine areas. The province is inhabited by indigenous people called Ivatans. There is a high level of floral endemicity, 251 species of flora with seven species found only in the island. Coral cover is from 7 to 60 percent. There are five species of reptiles, 10 bird species, and two species of mammals which are restricted to the region. Source of livelihood is farming and fishing. RA8991, dated January 5, 2001, is the law that established the Batanis group of islands and islets as protected area and its peripheral water as buffer zones. Protection for the area includes ban of mineral exploration or extraction in the forest lands, commercial fishing inside the municipal waters, fishing using of explosives and noxious substances, electricity or drift nets with mess below 3 centimeters between the knots. A survey of respondents living farthest and nearest to the protected area was conducted by personal interview using a survey questionnaire. Data from the survey was complemented by focus group discussions. Key informants were interviewed to elicit their personal thoughts about the value of biodiversity in Batanes. Respondents have heard of biodiversity and know what it means. They point to the ecosystem characterized by the presence of different types of animals, plants, and other organisms and their accompanying services and benefits. These responses do not deviate much from the meaning of, di of biodiversity as defined in the Convention of Biological Diversity at the Earth Summit in 1992, which says that biodiversity meant the variability among living organisms from all sources including inter alia, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, as well as the ecological complexes of which they are a part. The respondents also share that even with minimal knowledge of science, their familiarity and interaction with the environment has given them enough understanding on the ways of these different life forms. Biodiversity may not be an entity, but a property or quality of ecosystems. They may not be able to touch or smell it, but they are aware that it is a characteristic of ecosystem. Respondents also share that they are aware of the loss of biodiversity in some areas. The concept of total economic value or TEV as presented in this framework is applied to capture the wide range of benefits from biodiversity. TEV is composed of use and non-use values. Use values include direct and indirect consumptive use and option value. Non-use value is composed of existence and bequest value. The identification of use and non-use values of ecosystem services is a means to quantify biodiversity in economic terms, usually defined as the benefits people can extract from the ecosystems. We now look at the perspective of Ivatans on the use value of biodiversity. Direct or consumptive use values are the more obvious and visible benefits. Respondents were quick to share that biodiversity and the ecosystem provide their livelihood, a source of food, clothing, and shelter. In this slide, we see a community celebration in honor of the Dorado fish, which is a significant contributor to the livelihood of the people in the area. Ivatans also recognize biodiversity are supporting a substantial tourism industry and providing a pool of genetic materials. This is understandable given that Batanes is a favorite tourist destination, both for its landscape and cultural heritage. 
Indirect use values or non consumptive values are defined in terms of the ecosystem role as a regulator of ecosystem processes. Respondents agree that biodiversity and this ecosystem provide protective ecological services such as carbon sequestration, soil, and water protection. They also recognize protection from natural, natural hazard as one of the ecological functions, and this recognition is very strong in Batanes, which is characterized by relatively harsh weather conditions. In the right portion of the slide, we see how plants are used by the Ibatans to protect the soil in sloping areas and as buffer from the strong winds coming from the sea. Auction value is recognized by respondents. They believe that there are potential benefits from the ecosystem aside from what they are enjoying at present. FGD participants pointed to the fact that people will probably have to rely on the use of biological species diversity to satisfy newly emerging needs or cope with new challenges, like a shared unknown pest in agriculture or unknown diseases. They also highlighted options for recreational opportunities and for spiritual inspiration. Because of recognition of option value, one may express a willingness to pay to conserve the forest in order to protect the biodiversity there, which may have some use in the future. Having the opportunity to travel to see an endangered species or a new ecosystem is an option value because an individual values the opportunity, whether they actually take it or not. The irreversibility of biodiversity loss is one reason many individuals have a high option value for biodiversity. In the non-use value category, we look at existence value. Respondents emphasize that they value their national park simply because it exists. They argue that biodiversity is for some reason a condition for a good human life. Existence value is an individual's moral conviction that the environment has its own intrinsic value. Thus, while one may never see a coral reef, they think it is important that coral reef exists. Thus, existence value is a way to account for the intrinsic value of nature, the value of biodiversity for its own sake. Existence value constitutes a significant portion of the total economic value of some ecosystems because of its sensitivity to social norms and values, or the so-called warm glow effect. This is manifested in the response of participants that biodiversity serves as anchor for history, culture, and religion. Motivations may vary from some feeling about the intrinsic value of the forest to notions of stewardship, cultural or spiritual value, the rights of other living things, among others. Off-site use of natural assets as sources of inspiration, visualization, or objects of meditation is important to many. The wilderness can provide spiritual or personal inspiration without having to visit the area. It is important to simply know that wilderness exists. As with other environmental goods and services, the general conclusions are that existence values can be substantial in contexts where the forest in question are themselves unique in some sense or contain some form of highly prized biodiversity. The existence value relates to the valuation of biological diversity for its own sake and is reflected in donations for nature conservation and environment protection. Still on non-use value, we now look at bequest value. Respondents agree that the benefits from biodiversity must be available for future generations. They believe in the individual's value of passing intact ecosystems to their children so that they can use it and derive the same benefits that they currently enjoy. In this slide, we see photos of the coconut crab, the dorado fish, and the birds of Batanes, which the respondents want to bequest to the future generations. Most participants spoke of bequest value as a gift carrying responsibility with it. It is their responsibility to preserve the ecosystem and biodiversity for future generations. And likewise, 
future generations had an ongoing bequest responsibility to preserve it. This points to the respondents' readiness to spend goods in order to preserve biological diversity and its components for future generations. They expounded that future development options and future use should be consistent with current value systems. Some respondents made it clear that the bequest of wilderness was of the holistic wilderness and not simply of undeveloped land for future use. The bequest of wilderness is seen as the bequest of cultural ideas to future generations. Analysis of both use and unused value shows that in many cases, respondents attach a high value on native plants and animals, which contribute significantly to spiritual enrichment and recreation. Biodiversity is central to the cultures of the people in Batanes. Willingness to pay or willingness or WTP is an economic term used to determine the economic value of a resource, and it is measured by the maximum amount of other things that a person is willing to give up to have that resource or service. Although the willingness to pay for programs that will preserve biodiversity and the ecosystem can be inferred from the recognition of use and unused values, an explicit stated preference was elicited from the respondents of Batanes. Majority of the respondents are willing to assign monetary value to the biodiversity and ecosystem. Although in the minority, there are respondents in all eight parks who explicitly stated that they are not willing to assign a monetary value to biodiversity. They argued that it is considered unethical to question the worth of biodiversity. The sense of moral obligation, an alienable right, our cultural and spiritual support is sufficient rationale for requiring responsible stewardship on the part of the people. Such response supports the claim of many studies that non-use values which include spiritual or cultural importance of a landscape or species have often been influential in decision making, but these benefits are rarely valued in monetary terms. They often form the majority of the total economic value but remain largely invisible in the day-to-day -day accounts of society. Respondents who express willingness to assign a monetary value to biodiversity admitted that they cannot confidently quote a specific amount. They argue that one's ability to earn a living or to have access to basic needs such as food and shelter could allow them to have some rough estimate. However, they are not confident to assign values to the more significant indirect use and non-use benefits because of their invisi invisibility and therefore accounting for them is not straightforward. This is understandable given that recognizing value in ecosystems, landscape, species, and other aspects of biodiversity is sometimes sufficient to ensure conservation and sustainable use. This may be the case when the spiritual or cultural values of nature are strong. For example, the existence of sacred groves in the parks has helped to protect natural areas and the biodiversity they contain without the need to attach a monetary value on the services they provide. Likewise, protected areas such as national parks have been established in response to a sense of collective heritage or patrimony. A perception of shared cultural or social value attached on treasured landscapes, charismatic species, or natural wonders. The discussion therefore demonstrated the economic value of biodiversity even if it did not resolve in specific measures that capture value such as a WTP estimate. For my concluding remarks, I would like to highlight that valuing ecosystems and biodiversity should acknowledge the limits and complexities involved and cover different types of value appreciation. In situations where cultural consensus on the value of ecosystem services is strong and the science is clear, it may be relatively straightforward to demonstrate values in monetary terms and capture them in markets. In more complex situations involving multiple ecosystems and services, 
and or plural, plurality of ethical or cultural convictions, monetary valuations may be less reliable or unsuitable. In such cases, simple recognition and demonstration of value may be more appropriate. Protective legislation or voluntary agreements can be appropriate responses where biodiversity values are generally recognized, accepted, and demonstrated. Demonstrating the full range of ecosystem service values can help increase awareness and commitment to sustainable management of biodiversity. It is recognized from a range of studies that the cost of setting up and managing protected areas including the opportunity costs incurred by foregoing economic activity are commonly far outweighed by the value of ecosystem services provided by such areas. However, many of the benefits of protected areas are enjoyed far into the future, such as carbon storage. While costs tend to be local and immediate, thus the need for protective legislation and voluntary agreements. The challenge for decision makers is to assess when market-based solutions to biodiversity loss are likely to be culturally acceptable as well as effective, efficient, and equitable. I end my presentation with this quote from a play in 1896. Man is endowed with reason and creative powers to increase and multiply his inheritance. Yet up to now he has created nothing only destroyed. The forests grow fewer, the rivers parch, the wildlife is gone, and the climate is ruined. And with every passing day, the earth becomes uglier and poorer. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Abanti, for your presentation. Uh, all the papers that were presented were very interesting. So uh, now we go to the question and answer portion. Uh, we now have all uh, presenters uh, with their, uh, they already turned on their videos. So uh, there are two ways by which you can ask your question. You can write it uh, in the chat box or you can uh, raise your hand and uh, we can give you the opportunity to ask your question. So please, uh, please tell us first your name and your affiliation, and then probably uh, mention to whom uh, the question is being addressed. Uh, we have uh, our first question. It's from uh, Professor Zenaida Bawanan. Uh, she says, thanks for the three presentations. My question is Professor Malabrigo. Um, you mentioned about the, sorry, my eyes are not so good. Uh, the species of Pinus kisia, uh, what is its defining feature uh, to be considered as an SSP? Yes, thank you for Ma'am Zeni for that uh, very challenging question. Uh, in fact, uh, it's highly uh, taxonomic. No? That question is highly taxonomic. Uh, by the way, it's Pinus casilla subspecies Langbianensis, the uh, most updated correct name of our uh, Benguet pine. To the question on what features should be considered uh, for us to declare one taxon as a subspecies. Uh, basically, there is no standard criterion or criteria uh, and uh, you know very much that taxonomies use different species concepts. Uh, so it's always up to the taxonomist because one of the principles of taxonomy or uh, classification is that it depends on judgment and the taxonomists are the judge. So it's up to the, to the taxonomist if he uh, observe some commonalities between two species, but then there are still variations, consistent variations, then he or she can name it a subspecies or any intraspecific level, subspecies, forma, variety. But up to the standard or quantifiable criteria, we don't have that yet. Okay, Genetically, uh, when they use uh, 
uh, in in genetic species concept uh, they have some degree of similarities for instance uh, at least uh, 20 percent deep genetic differences among populations or rather between uh, populations and so on and so forth i'm not so sure but that uh, but that is how we uh, we define or that is how we consider any taxon as a as 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 an infraspecific level it could be a subspecies a variety or a format so uh, we don't have a standard criteria okay thank you uh, are there other questions other people who would like to ask anything You can raise your hand virtually uh, if you have something to ask. Okay, so while maybe others are formulating their, their questions, uh, is it okay if I ask all three of you this one question? Uh, because I, I heard from uh, Professor Bansi's talk uh, where she said that the, the more unique the, the area is, parang the more uh, interested people are, or the more passionate people are at preserving or conserving uh, what they have. In, in your own study areas, like in uh, the Cordillera and in Palawan and in uh, Batanes, was there any indication while you were doing your study that people were aware of the of the level of endemicity that they had in their in their forests among their trees and then among the different birds in Palawan and even among the uh, various natural resources in in the Batanes. So maybe we can start with uh, Professor. Okay, so um, you uh, the the Ibatans have a very high level of awareness. The sa mga uh, species na in their in their uh, community, both plants and animals, very high yung awareness na and very very conscious sila na most of these are available only doon there in 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 Batanes. I I have one I, a very short story about about one of our respondents in Sabtang. This is another island uh, uh, from. Uh, that you that that you have to travel one hour by boat from Basco to Sabtang. This is the area where you have all the stone houses, the traditional stone houses. In one of the focus group discussions that we that we had, one farmer said that uh, very high yung valuation niya sa mga birds, na sa mga birds uh, uh, on the birds in the area. Uh, and it is not because uh, there is a direct use value that he could derive from the birds. It's just that even if he's so tired and hungry while working, when the birds begin to sing, and he said that there is a very unique bird that does that, the bird seems to know that he is tired and he is hungry. And so he timed his song later in the morning when he's already tired. And, and that, that already removes the tiredness and the hunger, and he would feel that he is ready to work again. So he described that as, as something that is valuable. He can, he, he, it is not food, it is not shelter, it's not clothing, but it is something that is psychological and emotional. And he believes that that, that bird is endemic to the place and is unique only to that place, not even in Basco, it's only in some time. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I can ask Dr. Suji now. Uh, Dr. Suji, were, were they aware, the Palawans, were they aware that they were dealing and catching unique uh, birds? Uh, yes, actually, the government and PCSDS, Palawan Council for Sustainable Development, uh, administration is aware of the, bio, the biodiversity, but actually local people are not aware of the uh, bird population. Rather, they are playing with hunting birds. So as for local people, they don't be aware, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Dr. Malabrigo, were were they were they aware that they have provincial endemics in their area? Uh, yeah, of course. I can only speak uh, based on the my communications with the local guides because, as I have mentioned in my uh, presentation, we don't have biodiversity value survey study. It's only on the uh, uh, biodiversity itself on the plants. So, uh, uh, my observation is that. Those, the local guides and other people who attended the, the training, uh, the orientations, they are aware of the diversity. They know they have diverse plants in their area. Unfortunately, they are, they are not aware of the value of this biodiversity. Uh, it's, for them, it seems it, the, the species are common because they often see that, but they do not know that, that some of the species are only known to occur in that area. Uh, of course, the threatened or the conservation status, they don't know about that, that the species is already endangered or vulnerable, vulnerable or threatened. So that's why our recommendation is uh, to make this study and uh, probably an IEC material for the uh, awareness campaign about this unique biodiversity of these uh, provinces. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions at this point? Oh, okay. Uh, we have one question from, uh, I think, sir, Malabrigo, this is for you. Uh, is Pinus a dominant species in the Ifugao area? Uh, yes, uh, in our study area, uh, the Pinus quadrants or the Pinus itself, constitute 42% of all the trees. That's only for the trees, the, of all the trees that were uh, recorded in survey. You, uh, we know the Cordillera areas is really a pine area, a pine country. Yes, it's very dominant. Okay, and we have, I think we have another question for you. Uh, yeah, this is from Dr. Nsuji for Dr. Malabrigo. I'm interested in indigenous knowledge could you share an example of good knowledge of species identification of plants? Okay. Uh, so basically, uh, the reason why I said they have good knowledge on identification is that uh, they consistently use the same name for a particular species. So unlike in other areas where we, uh, where we had a lot of surveys, Local people, our guide, which is uh, supposed to be the, the, the best among uh, the local people in the identification, they tend to call a species or different species which, which are not really which are not taxonomically related as the same in one name, the same name. So for, for the uh, for the tribe boundaries, our guides are very good that yes, there are some collective terms, but they, this collective term is uh, really for those species that are taxonomic, taxonomically related, meaning they call the syzygium species, a number of them, as bull tick. But that, for, for me, that is acceptable because they really look the same. Uh, I don't know where they got this traditional knowledge in identification, but my, uh, I, my, my suspicion is that because they are really into the utilization of the trees for a long time. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question for you, but then maybe I should um, move a bit to uh, Chancellor Abansi. I would like to know, was there any difference in the way the younger people and the older people were thinking about how they valued their, their resources. Yes, in our focus group discussions, the, the respondents have shared the sentiment that um, the way people value their resources are very different from between the old and the new generation. While the new generation have been imbued with, with respect for the environment and the resources. 
still the 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 cultural rootedness of the young is not as strong as the one as the old ones they would not when given a, a choice they would prefer to leave the area and find employment uh, in in manila or in, in nearby provinces but would not want to engage in work uh, that would make use of the resources of uh, botanics it's one thing that they share though that's why they requested the team uh, maybe i should take take the opportunity to thank also my team the pabidaho team uh for 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 this project so one one component of this project is the development of communication materials that would create awareness especially among the young so that this this worry of the young having a different uh, perspective and outlook on biodiversity can can be addressed and uh, a stronger awareness and feeling and and uh, for protection and preservation can can be uh, transferred from the old to the young generations thank you uh, our, our next question is addressed to dr suji uh, your report was done in 2013 uh, would you know if live trapping is still practiced in Palawan nowadays? Yes, and I'm still continuing my research in Palawan uh, until 2019, and they're still conducting the bird traps. Uh, and the question is, trapping is still practiced in Palawan nowadays? Yes. And they frequently enjoy bar trapping. And they would not stop because they are birds. And some uh, bar trapping are getting less because the technique is so complicated for the younger generation. So the answer is yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Malabrigo, I, I will read two questions uh, for you. Uh, the first one was asked a while ago, if your report is available and if people can have a copy of it. And then second is, uh, are there species, perhaps trees, would you, that you would recommend for restoration that would be good to promote considering the altitudinal gradients in the Cordillera mountain range? Okay, thank you Paul, for the question. For the first question, uh, we have submitted the report to DNRK, uh, courtesy to our client. Uh, if they can, they will make it available publicly, then uh, it's up to them. But uh, we will be uh, publishing it. Uh, the results of the study will be published. Uh, we plan to submit it uh, this month of July uh, in uh, a uh, for forestry journal. Okay, then for the second question, uh, what species of trees? So for the for restoration purposes, uh, particularly if we will, will be uh, having the restoration activity or uh, mostly on the gap areas, there are some pioneer species also in the uh, plant. Uh, if in the lowland we have the I mean, uh, Bagalunga or Macaranga Tanarius, we have the Antidesma gaysimbilia or Binayuyu. In the uplands, there are also a lot of gap species or pioneer species, which are uh, uh, heat tolerant, uh, wind tolerant, and even some uh, fire tolerant species. So among them are the Macaranga, also a Macaranga, Caudatifolia. Uh, sorry, I forgot the, the common name. And we also have the Umulantus, this are for uh, re, uh, related to uh, our Binunga of the Lowland, which is very, uh, very commonly used for or finer species. Uh, so uh, Umulantus, Popolneus, and Umulantus, uh, Macradenius, and of course, Pai Pirata, uh, uh, Tasmania Pai Pirata. Uh, it's a high elevation species but are tolerant to, uh, to open space, uh, to, to hit. So in fact, a lot of, uh, I, we have seen some 
uh, restoration activities that use this uh, Tasmania Piperata. Okay. Uh, are there other questions for our speakers? We have uh, six minutes left. Okay, we have one. Uh, regarding the transfer of old knowledge and praxis to new generations, uh, is it helpful to use oral tradition like oral literature or is it not applicable nowadays? I think this is uh, directed to Chancellor Abansi. Well, um, Bataan is, uh, although it's very far, uh, some technology, inform, uh, information technology has already reached the area and the young have been exposed to, to the benefits and the use of devices. Um, while, while oral tradition can help because uh, very, very faithful naman itong mga ibatans to their tradition eh. And they, they have they have lots of uh, events and practices where where knowledge about uh, biodiversity and the environment can be transferred. But because the young have been exposed to information technology and to other opportunities outside of Batanes, maybe a combination of both uh, the traditional way and the modern way uh, would be most effective. I think in, we can make use of information technology to, to, to inform the young without, without diluting the substantive element of the information that we want to transfer. I think we can't get away with information technology, but it has to be used in combination with existing oral tradition. Okay, yeah, uh, maybe while we're waiting, we, we have, I guess one more uh, room for one more question. But then while we're waiting for that person to ask the last question, we would like to encourage you to join us again uh, next week for uh, the second week of uh, this conference. And we thank you for, for joining us here. Uh, are there any, any more questions? Maybe one? May, may I share a little bit uh, okay. uh, before the last question? Parang nalimutan ko lang emphasize. In the study that I did, there is a ranking of the values that is being attached by people. Hindi ko na lang sinama kasi yung mga number-number yun, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which has to be converted into a willingness to pay. In, in that ranking, it is bequest value which has the highest uh, position in the valuation. And that is because the, this, the, the respondents as well as the key informant interviews are really worried that the young ones are not as, as uh, conscious and as sensitive now to, to biodiversity and the ecosystem. And so they want to emphasize the, their ability to be able to transfer to them a whole complete uh, preserve uh, ecosystem so that the young would appreciate that what they receive really is a gift from from the previous generation. Okay. Which is I think counterintuitive. Like I was thinking yeah. maybe the young ones would be more would be more concerned with what they have, especially with the information that they have about other areas being uh, they, they, they are they are concerned no man. It's just that the that the older people feel that not as strong as their their own conviction and their own uh, concern about the environment because they feel that the the mindset of the young ones have been adulterated and affected by external forces so parang ganun yung kanilang ano. so gustong gusto nila na sana mai-preserve natin at ma-realize nila that this is also something that they should preserve for their own, for the next, next, next generations. Yeah, thank you for, for that uh, information. Okay, I, I think we're, we're, we're done here. We would like to thank our speakers, Professor Malabrigo, Dr. Suji, and Chancellor Abansi for, for sharing with us your, your studies. Uh, we had very interesting uh, areas, very different, but, uh, and uh, the information that we got was, was really quite interesting. And thank you for all your questions. Mm -hmm.